Goedemorgen, dames en heren. Transavia, vlucht 6115, coacher met KLM. Oh my god, hi, how are you? Is this recording? <laughs> Everybody, it's Ali, and welcome back to One Month Two Cameras. Today I come to you with a new kind of video. This is what I'm calling camera chats, where I speak to another photographer and someone who is just in love with this medium, and in this case, the tools that make that medium. Today my guest is Sophie Lee, and if you've done any modicum of research into the Digicam space, you have likely come across her name. She is one of the co-founders of Digicam Love, which is a fantastic online community of Digicam lovers. She has done incredible work with her Digicams, and I was really fortunate to meet her and chat with her in Amsterdam on a crazy 24-hour layover. She was kind enough to show up not only to the airport, but to like take me around town for 24 hours, which was exceedingly generous and we got to just chat all day about cameras and various philosophies behind them about aesthetics and all of that jazz i was not prepared for this interview in total frankness so we're a little bit all over the place in terms of you know technicalities i had some issues with the sound i i have never experienced this before but the sound file just was completely corrupted from one segment which is sad because it was a great segment but i will do my best to work around that and offer some subtitling for points that i feel are still relevant even if the sound was not ideal um but this was our chat in amsterdam many thanks to sophie also many thanks to joe willem who also joined us at the very end of the night. He had offered to film the whole segment of us and just total last minute hero. Um, we didn't end up getting to do any of that just because we ran out of time and of light, but um, he was so lovely. So we'll see him at the end of the video as well. Many thanks to both of them. Here is our chat from Amsterdam. Okay, so tell me your name. I'm Sophie and I'm one of the founders of Digicam Love and I love Digicams. And where are we right now? We are in some kind of like capsule hostel in Amsterdam. So tell me a little bit how your love and interest in Digicams began. If, if I were to like really go back all the way, I would say like it started with like Tamagotchis. Tamagotchi, the original virtual reality pen. Your care determines the pets you get from Bandai. I really don't know how I got so many, yeah. but at some point I had like, like I would just like carry all of them with me. Like I had like... A, like Tamagotchis, Dinky Dinos, Giga Pets, like all these little virtual pets. Digicams like were much more, I would say a bit later in my life. I like kind of grew up around the time APS film, like that very short mm -hmm. instant APS film was a thing. Um, so we never really shot 35 millimeter um, and I always wanted to experiment with it as a kid, but my parents were always like, no, it's too expensive. Like it's a waste of money. Like I remember one time as a kid, I took my mom's camera and secretly took a photo of a bunch of fans on the ceiling and she got so mad at me. She was like, oh. Oh my god. Yeah, she was like, why did you take a picture of these fans? Right. <laughs> uh, later on, I got more into cinema, actually. And cinema was, I would say, like, my first, like, photograph, like, visual medium okay. that I was really into. I really, really wanted to, like, make movies. And um, I started experimenting with uh, photography around that time, too. Like, I would say this is 2000... Gosh, I would say, like, maybe 2009? Okay. 2010 yeah. yeah so like i mean digicams digicams were still pretty prevalent like it wasn't like they had been discontinued they were kind of at their height right right in they, that era to start waning i would say in yeah, that it was era like just the cliff yeah it was they fell off. just past the the cliff for sure yeah. the the uh the bump so like there were like good digicams that were still quite expensive at that time like yeah. did you what do you remember the first camera that you picked up right i do um I, I remember because I I was going about to go on a, a very long solo trip to Ohio. Uh, this is back when I was living in Massachusetts. It was the first time I traveled something somewhere like that 
I'm by myself. One thing was like, I'm going to buy a camera because I don't have a camera. And it was like a Sony, I want to say a Sony W85. Okay. I would say that was like the first like camera I really got to use. I don't like have like, I don't know, like I, I don't know where it is. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, I don't even have an attachment to that camera specifically or even that model. I found it like kind of limiting. Yeah. Um, and but the thing is that the the very the really big camera that first um i would say like spoke to me was um actually it was at a thrift store in portland oregon i saw a uh, kyocera fine cam s3 actually i have the kd300 right here which is the um konica rebadge of it i remember seeing this flash right here and just oh. like being so enamored by how yeah, the shape is gorgeous. yeah it just it like it it at the same time looks really generic mm -hmm. but also very distinct like yeah. it it looks like something from a different time for sure yeah and i just saw it and it was just sitting on a shelf and i i thought this is like so beautiful and i was like what if i got and i said to like the person who was with me at the at the uh, store, I was like, what if I started getting into shooting old digital cameras? And she was like, oh, it would be really annoying dealing with batteries and stuff. Like, it's not worth it. What year yeah. are you talking? This is 2012. Wait. Yeah, it's 2012. 12, yeah. Okay. And this camera is for circa 2004 or something? 2000... No, it's 2001. 2001. This is actually the first... Uh, or they claim to be the first camera to take SD cards. Oh. Um, if you look at any of the like press releases, they say, oh, it takes the new uh, SD card format. Oh my God, where does it max out? 512? This one actually maxes out at two gigs. So oh. I have a two gig card Amazing. in it. Yeah. And like when I, when I use it, it lets me take like a thousand, two thousand photos. It's like crazy. That's dreamy. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, obviously I'm fairly familiar with your work and the things that you've shot over the years. And I've noticed you've had kind of like, uh, you know, varying sort of generations of cameras that you've been attracted to at various points in your um, photographic journey. Mm -hmm. So tell me kind of about those waves and kind of you started with the early, early digicams. And then I remember hearing you kind of had a threshold where you're like, I don't want to shoot anything under this megapixel mm -hmm. count. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about how like how all of this evolved and where you've landed now. In the beginning, like, I was really into bokeh, actually, and I know this was, like, brought up. And this was, like, at the time when you could go on, um, I don't know, on Flickr, and people would be like, just got my Canon uh, F50 F1.4, and there's, like, an eyelash in focus, yes. you know? Or it would be just, like, a picture. It would be, like, the, the title would be, like, uh, Fall Dreams, and just be a, a woman just, like standing there and like only like like part of her cheek is in focus and there's like all these like <laughs> leaves that are out of focus next to her um and i remember thinking like wow that's so cool you know i think we all kind of thought that at the time yeah. at the time like my my main my main camera this was like i would say 2012 like around the time i started getting more serious about photography um my main camera was like uh it was a it was the uh, HTC, I think I started with the HTC Wildfire S, which is a cell phone, actually. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, was like, and, I don't know that one. Yeah. And then I started getting more, and then I got a more modern, at the time, Android phone. So I started okay. using that. And I basically mostly did macro shots because that was like the way to get things out of focus. Yeah. When I could, like, I got a DSLR. Um, I kind of like went in that direction, you know, I, or like I had a mirrorless, so then I got. I sold it for like a DSLR. Wait, you went mirrorless first and then DSLR? You know, actually, I think it was the other way around. Okay. Yeah, now I think about it. No, okay. I had the DS. I'm not so sure. Yeah, I think it was the other way around. Yeah. Well, 2012 is when the Sony A7 yeah. came out, the yeah. first one. So yes. it could have been that you went mirrorless and then did DSLR. No, no, it was definitely. Um, it was definitely the other way around actually it's I'm a bit fuzzy yeah <laughs> on I, this I, yeah i had i had the i had the d nikon d5000 okay. um and i i did my my out of focus shots you know and then and then but i didn't find it too inspiring actually it was like you lug this really big thing and a bunch of lenses mm -hmm. and then 
And then you go online and people are like, this lens sucks. Am I allowed to say that? On- yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> you go online and there's like reviews being, this lens sucks. Like you, sh- why I only shoot prime lenses, you know? Right. Like, that was a huge yeah. piece of the conversation. Yeah. And, um, and then like around the same time, I also was like shooting film and there was so much like film discourse too. Mm-hmm. Like, like you go online, of course, it's like, yeah, like why I only shoot 51.4 lenses. Uh, and then also there's like why mirrorless is like not as good as DSLR. Like there's right. a lot of backlash against mirrorless and totally. in some uh, like echelons of the echelons. What is that? Echelons. Echelons yeah. of the photography world. Yeah. Um, and then there was the, and then there's like, of course, like the film, like the film anti-digital backlash. Right. Um, and so I was just kind of like there. Oh, and then there was the smartphone thing right. too. Right. Like I, I was like, just kind of like in the middle of all this, you know, like coming of age as a photographer. Um, and then like one day I like had this dream that I, I like, there was like something different about like digital cameras. Like it was like a picture. It was like an image of a mountain you know, and then I was like, I, I like need to find out like what it is that was like different. Like I, was, I just felt drawn, like this maybe is a literal dream. You had. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of wow. like, maybe, I don't know, like I'm, I'm not like a super spiritual person or anything, but like I had this like spiritual, like call to it. I, I know this sounds like very like cult leader or I whatever, it. but no, like no, it, it, it was definitely like, Oh, like I, there, there's something there that needs uh-huh. to be explored. Yeah. So I, I was like, I want to find out what was different about it, like what was unique about it and what, and also like what would, um, what would like be the next, I guess like the next, like, I don't know, like the next thing, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like film was, I I didn't see like film as being like very sustainable, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. Like I already saw, like it was, I actually shot a lot of film at the time too. Um, and this is still back when, like, you could go and get a Yashica T5 for, like, $3. Oh God, I um, I had, like, three Yashica T5s, actually. I had the entire Yashica oh <laughs> lineup, um, just from going to the thrift store. And, but, like, I, I didn't feel it very inspiring to shoot it. So I, I would say, like, there was, like, definitely that, like, evolution of, like, my understanding of, like, photography. And I think, like, a lot of photographers also go through a similar evolution, like, especially if you're, like, getting into it now. Like, you, you, you like, associate DSLRs with, like, this, like, uh, shallow depth of field mm-hmm. look, and you, you, like, want this, and it looks, like, more expensive or, like, fancy. Um, yeah, but I, I kind of went through this whole, like, uh, growth, and then I uh, enrolled in a community college um, trade, like, uh, trade school kind of, uh, photography program at this. It's, I think it's defunct now. I don't, I think, um, but it was at Seattle Central College, uh, which is also where, uh, Macklemore and Jimi Hendrix went. Amazing. And I think Bruce Lee also went there. Yeah. You might have to fact check that, but yeah. (laughs) yeah. Um, so I had like a really strong commercial background. Like Uh we were trained in a studio to work with studio lights, uh, both hot and, uh, yeah, continuous continuous lights, continuous and strobe. Uh, we learned like four point lighting. Um, we also had to learn how to do video. Uh, we, we like had everything started thinking that there was more responsibility that photographers had in um, image creating. And I started getting really into like the, the revolutionary like ideas of like new wave cinema, like French mm-hmm. new wave cinema. Mm-hmm. Like I was reading a lot of Godard at the time and I was intensely fascinated by this cinema. Um, I've, I am not as like deeply into it now. Mm-hmm. I feel like I've You've been there. Yeah, I've been there. But but like I, I kind of like some like more ideological like uh, disagreements with his work yeah. now. But um, at the time I was like, you know, it was like first exposure to um, this like deconstruction of like what our medium, what any medium is and how it's constructed. Mm-hmm. Um, and like this is like the stuff that was more excluded from the deep review interview. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I yeah. So, you know, like. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Godard was really Godard, or yep, as they say, yeah, Godard <laughs> was really into um, uh, 
uh, bringing this like Marxist perspective to mm-hmm. cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like in one of his films, I can't remember which one, but he there's a character that says that cinema is that says photography is truth and cinema is truth twenty four times a second, um, which. I, I think the actually the, the meaning of that is that all of it is a lie. La photographie c'est la vérité. Et le cinéma c'est 24 fois la vérité par seconde. Vous vous appelez Veronica comment? Elle n'a pas répondu tout de suite. That was a huge that was like just a just like light bulb comes off and then I started asking why do our images look the way they do? Like why are we why are we um why do we expect bokeh why do we expect this to be sharp why do we expect noise to be here like no, no noise, noise to be here yeah. yeah why do we expect to, to be, them to be crisp and clean and then the more i dug into the history of photography i realized that um our views of what an image what of what a good image is mm-hmm. is primarily shaped by the circumstances of the culture that surrounded photography at the time for example um, like Ansel Adams, mm-hmm. uh, his group was really, um, really brought us the the focus on sharpness, mm-hmm. uh, and then before that, it, there was the uh, pictorialism, right? Yeah, movement, which is more dreamy, you know, like right. Yeah, but it's all it's kind of an evolution of painting, right? Yeah, like exactly. how it's just like the visual information has. Yeah, I guess that's the culture piece, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was something I was pressing against uh, in photography, like, as I entered the field more and more in general. Um, but I found that digicams were really suitable for the purpose. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that is also, like, it's been a very long journey, you know, and it's still going for me. Um, like, the noise stuff is actually something I embrace more recently, and um, that has to do with um, when I started getting more into um, noise music and like music concrete and like, you know, like a lot of the, uh, or like Onkyoke, which is like a Japanese, like minimalist um, music movement in the nineties. It was also influenced by like uh, Daido Moriyama's, yes. like yeah, I think that's a very, um, very like notable like touch point like within the medium, but mm-hmm. but also it came from outside the medium for me too. Like it was um, more oral. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Because um, you know this this discussion about um, digital and film also was uh, part of this discussion about uh, analog and digital music but like at the at the time when I was in university uh studying when I was in this like trade school rather studying photography I was pushing back on a lot of things I was like um pushing back on the subjectivity of the of the camera Mm -hmm. um I I like broke the fourth wall a lot in a lot of my like um a lot of my my photos like I, I would have the the subject look directly into the camera you know, mm-hmm. or I would have like my finger in front of the lens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I studied like, I think like a lot of my colleagues, they would like pull, I think it just turned oh, off. <laughs> I'm just going to say that that's, we're going to leave that on a cliffhanger because okay. we need to eat. But I want to yeah. circle back to that subject because yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. Do you? There's no air left to breathe Do you just wanna To be left outside the grave It's all for sure I didn't know I wonder what it meant to be If I let go and let it flow I think there's more to see Do you remember where we left off? Yeah, I do. Okay. I, I So I saw the S3 But it was actually a bit later uh, It was in 2014 When I had the idea To like actually get a digital camera for myself um so that was like the power shot g2 i specifically wanted something that had like the fastest lens uh, and i shot that camera for pretty much a year yeah yeah i had it with me everywhere and it's you have one so you know it's not small 
now. It's big and heavy and I wore it around my neck and I put a guitar strap on it. Amazing. And just wore it like almost everywhere I went. This would have been the summer of G2, right? Yes, yes. That was the summer of G2 project, which um, most of the work was done during that summer, uh, the summer of 2014, um, when I did a lot of like traveling around the Pacific Northwest. At the A7, I've been in Nolte, uh, Dynix 5, yeah. which is the film camera. Um, and I would swap lenses with the A7 because I had the, that adapter on the A7. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I would also carry the G2 with me. So I had all these cameras with oh me, right? Like on all these trips, and I would just like swap, like switch off, like taking photos with it. Um, That's a lot. Yeah, but the, the G2, I was like always just, I don't know, like I took it everywhere. You know, I was shooting lots of street photography. With it. So, like, what are the qualifications? Add to your collection now. Like, what are you looking for in an Indian camera? Uh, now it's like completely different. Before it was, I was looking for stuff that had, um, that had raw. I think, yeah. Um, but now I mostly just, I just look for stuff that I'm really selective now. It's like completely different. I look for stuff that looks weird and has something strange or unique about it. First of all, I look for cameras that I can shoot at max ISO. I always test them at max ISO now. I never shoot at base. Yeah. And then I see what the noise is like. And if the noise has like a lot of like finale to it, then that's like how I know it's going to Does like color noise factor into that? Or is it more a texture thing or a combination of the two? It's kind of a combination of two things. Um, so I noticed that a lot of like people when they get like old digital cameras look for something that has the least chroma noise. Um, but I actually try to get as much chroma noise as possible. Um, and that's because I, I come to realize that chroma noise functions as like micro micro contrasts in some ways, um, and that there's actually a lot more texture to the image if I use like something that has more chroma noise to it. Yeah. There, there are some cameras that I've got, the Contax i4R, which like is so fun to use yeah, and so cute. cute. Well, yeah, it's so cute. I didn't bring it with me, unfortunately. But like the images are just so uninspiring, in my opinion. Um, is that like noise reduction in the JPEG processing or something? It's, I mean, there's a like, good amount of noise, but there's like no color. You know what I mean? Like there's no color to the noise and there's actually no color over. Good. Okay. Um, okay. So we were kind of touching on Digicam Love, but tell me a little bit more about it. Like, I know how you guys came together, but kind of the ethos of the group and kind of how you think about photography and as a collective. Yeah, definitely. We So we think about photography as something that should be accessible and approachable for everyone. And we think uh, dig all digital cameras are a great way for that, um, especially because they're plentiful in the market still, and also um, they should be a lot cheaper than like to get into than film photography and uh, DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. They like I definitely felt a sense of fresh frustration uh, about the the fact that you know like there is a huge like barrier to film uh, in that way, you know, like a monetary barrier. Like, I just want to do like my photography and like take pictures and, you know, um, and it like, for me, like digital photography, like felt a lot more natural, like this old digicam stuff. And it also allowed me to interact with like gadgets and, um, find out like how, like, you know, like appreciate like the older technology, uh, and also like stay away from like my phone, the whole like the streaming, the surveillance, like all sorts of stuff. Like it basically like I just wanted to use my phone as little as possible. And like when I first started getting into this, I was like doing this because, you know, like it's easy to like take a photo and then notice on your phone and then notice that it's a message and just end up like scrolling through something. Well, that's true. You've got class.